Hi guys, so welcome to Tuesday, April 14th. Um, today we are going to do the second read through for Down at the Dinghy, and we are going to break it down uh, by characterization, themes and main ideas, and literary elements slash terms slash figurative language. So I'm going to be using three different colors. I'll show them. Um, to break this up so that you guys get a better idea of how it breaks down. And if you have printed off your own copy of it, please feel free to highlight in different colors or underline in different colors, whatever you have, or maybe highlight in one highlighted color that you have and then put a star next to another element and underline something else. Whatever materials you have, use them to your advantage to break down what you will be annotating for down at the dinghy and then this will also help you uh, give you ideas of not only how to annotate your short stories for your future literary analysis but also uh, to give you ideas on how to organize it a little bit better and organize your thought process so let's get started oops what did I do Okay, so you'll notice that I'm using a green highlighter, a pink highlighter, and a blue highlighter, these fancy little things. And with each color, I'm going to be highlighting something different. I'm sorry, I don't know why this keeps on unzooming like this. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so for the green highlighter, I'm going to be highlighting things that show characterization. Um, for the pink highlighter, I'm going to be highlighting types of themes and main ideas. And then for the yellow highlighter, I'm going to be highlighting for literary elements slash terms slash figurative language, things that we've discussed before in previous PowerPoints, such as symbolism. Uh, uh, I'm blanking because I'm, I'm having a brain thing. Uh, so yeah, figurative language. <laughs> I'm sorry guys, I can't believe I can only think of one example right now. Um, foreshadowing, that's really big in, down at the dinghy. So let's get started. Alright, <clears throat> so we're just going to be reading through it again, but then I'm going to stop when it comes to certain parts of the story that show these themes. It was a little after four o'clock on an Indian summer afternoon. Some 15 or 20 times since noon, Sandra, the maid, had come away from the lake front window in the kitchen with her mouth set tight. This time as she came away, she absently untied and retied her apron strings, taking up what little slack her enormous waistline allowed. So, right there is some characterization for Sandra, the maid. She is um, sorry, Sandra the maid. Uh, she has her mouth set tight, and she keeps on coming back and forth between the window, untying and retying her apron strings, taking up what little slack her enormous waistline allowed. So not only is it describing her as a character in itself, I am so sorry, I don't know why this keeps on unzooming and resuming. Oh. But it also gives an idea of characterization of what she's feeling at this moment without actually saying that she's feeling anxious or nervous or worrisome. By retying her apron strings, you know when you're worried about something, you're anxious about something, you usually, uh, sometimes you fiddle with things. I pick at my nails, some people um, bite their nails, and then some people just like, they're fidgety. So she was fidgeting with her apron strings. Then she went back to the enamel table and lowered her freshly uniformed body into the seat opposite Mrs. Snell. Mrs. Snell, having finished the cleaning and ironing, was having her customary cup of tea before walking down the road to the bus stop. Mrs. Snell had her hat on. It was the same interesting black felt headpiece she had worn, not just all summer, but for the past three summers, through record heat waves, through change of life, over scores of ironing boards, over the helms of dozens of vacuum cleaners. The Hattie Carnegie label was still inside it, faded, 
but it might be said unbowed. So this is kind of talking about Mrs. Snell's characterization too. So she is the caretaker of this little cabin by the lake that she's there all um, the time. And she's always seems to be wearing this felt headpiece for the past three summers. So that can say that one, maybe she doesn't make a lot of money, uh, so she bought her something, self something nice but can't continue to do so. Um, but also the fact that maybe it means something to her. Maybe it's the only nice thing she's ever bought for herself, so she's really attached to it. So that can say a lot about her character, Mrs. Snell's character. I'm not going to worry about it, Sandra announced, for the fifth or sixth time, addressing herself as much as Mrs. Snell. I made up my mind. I'm not going to worry about it. What for? That's right, said Mrs. Snell. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I really wouldn't. Reach me my bag, dear. So obviously we know from what she did up here that, yeah, she actually is probably a little bit worrying. But she's saying I'm not going to worry about it, even though she's obviously worrying about it. A leather handbag, extremely worn, but with a label inside it, as impressive as the one inside Mrs. Snell's hat, lay on the pantry. Sandra was able to reach it without standing up. She handed it across the table to Mrs. Snell, who opened it and took out a pack of mentholated cigarettes and a folder of stork club matches. So again, it's talking about something that Mrs. Snell owns, a nice uh, a leather handbag, even though it's extremely worn, so she's had it before, or had it for a while, but it's still considered a nice leather handbag, and if you guys know anything about leather goods, even today, they're pretty expensive. So that might say something, that she likes nice things, but she also knows how to take care of nice things and doesn't just continue to buy them. Um, so that can be, oops. And labeled items like that, because she's saying the label of it, the author said uh, he, the author, is saying that the label uh, is, is just as impressive as the one inside Mrs. Snell's hat uh, because Mrs. Snell's hat had a Hattie Carnegie label, really popular brand back then, and the Carnegies, if you've ever heard of that family, really rich family. So um, having a leather handbag with a uh, labeled good is really important, kind of like Coach is today, like a really popular labeled good. So it shows kind of status in a way even though it's extremely worn. So it could even be used. Mrs. Snell lit a cigarette, then brought her teacup to her lips, but immediately set it down in its saucer. If this don't hurry up and cool off, I'm gonna miss my bus. She looked over at Sandra, who was staring oppressively in the general direction of the copper saucepans lined against the wall. Stop worrying about it, Mrs. Snell ordered. What's good it's going to do to worry about it? Either he tells her or he don't. That's all. What's good worrying going to do? I'm not worrying about it, Sander responded. The last thing I'm going to do is worry about it. Only it drives you loony the way that kid goes pussyfooting all around the house. You can't hear him, you know. I mean, nobody can hear him, you know. Just the other day, I was shelling beans right at this here table, and I almost stepped on his hand. He was sitting right under the table. So just, uh... This is characterization, not only for um, Mrs. Snell up here, kind of telling uh, uh, Sandra to calm down. So she's kind of like a little bit of a bossy um, sort of personality. So she ordered that. But also um, it gets to that kid who we later find out is Lionel who is the owner's son, and if you, uh, you might have been like, what does that mean, pussyfooting? It kind of means that you're kind of like walking on eggshells, and you're also at the same time, you're kind of like soft-footed, you're, you walk quietly around. Um, so he's kind of, um, walking silently around, and usually that kind of also means that he's being really quiet and trying not to be seen as much, and kind of being, trying to keep out of the way while also just being super quiet, which kind of shows his personality a lot because kids his age, he's like, I think described it, I think he's, uh, they say he's four. 
how many four-year-olds do you know that are super quiet all the time and just like described as pussyfooting around it's it's not a po- it's not a common description for a four-year-old especially a four-year-old boy so this is concerning to them but it's also a good uh, characterization description of Lionel you can't hear him you know oh sorry well I wouldn't worry about it I mean you gotta weigh every word you say around him Sandra said it drives you loony so they're also saying the fact that they have to weigh every word around him so they have to be careful what they say around him because he gets upset really easily I still can't drink this Mrs. Snell said that's terrible when you gotta weigh every word you say and all it drives you loony I mean it half the time I'm half loony Sandra brushed some imaginary crumbs off her lap and snorted a four-year-old kid he's kind of a good-looking kid said Mrs. Snell them big brown eyes and all Sandra snorted again he's gonna have a nose just like the father She raised her cup and drank from it without any difficulty. I don't know what they want to stay up here all October for, she said malcontently, lowering her cup. I mean, none of them even go anywhere near the water now. She don't go in, he don't go in, the kid don't go in. Nobody goes in now. They don't even take that crazy boat out no more. I don't know what they threw good money away on it for. I don't know how you can drink yours. I can't even drink mine. So Mrs. Snell is kind of in the conversation, but at the same time, she's kind of avoiding the conversation as well. She doesn't really want to talk about it. Uh, Sandra stared rancorously at the opposite wall. I'll be so glad to get back to the back of the city. I'm not fooling. I hate this crazy place. She gave Mrs. Snell a hostile glance. It's all right for you. You live here all year round. You got your social life here and all. You don't care. I'm going to drink this if it kills me, Mrs. Snell said, looking at the clock over the electric stove. So she's looking at the clock over the electric stove, which, again, characterization in a way, she's kind of being impatient and she kind of wants to leave this conversation, which is why she's avoiding talking about it by talking about something else. But also the fact that she's waiting for the time where she can leave for her bus, but without seeming rude. Um, what would you do if you were in my shoes, Sandra asked abruptly. I mean, what would you do? Tell the truth. This was the sort of question Mrs. Snell slipped into as if it were an ermine coat. She at once let her teacup go. Well, in the first place, she said, I wouldn't worry about it. What I'd do, I'd look around for another. So she's, this is the sort of question that Mrs. Snell slipped into as if it was an ermine coat. Kind of is suggesting the fact that um, she likes to answer these questions and she likes to, uh, people taking her advice and listening to her. She likes being in charge. So she slips that on like a really nice coat. I'm not worried about it, Sandra interrupted. I know that, but what I do, I just get me. The swinging door opened from the dining room and Boo Boo Tannenbaum what a lovely name, right? Uh, the lady of the house came into the kitchen. She was a small, almost hipless girl of 25, with styleless, colorless, brittle hair pushed back behind her ears, with, which were very large. So some characterization, oops, some characterization of Boo Boo Tanning Bomb. She was dressed in knee-length jeans, a black turtle pullover, and socks. and loafers her joke of a name aside her general unprettiness aside she was in terms of permanently memorable immoderately perceptive small area faces a stunning and final girl she went directly to the refrigerator and opened it as she peered inside with her legs apart and her hands on her knees she whistled unmelodically through her teeth keeping time with a little uninhibited pendulum action of her rear end Sandra and Mrs. Snell were silent. Mrs. Snell put out her cigarette unhurriedly. I'm going to stop the video right here, and we will continue on for the next video, so stay tuned.